come to the last presentation of this block, and that's uh, John Mitchell. Uh, it's not Joni Mitchell, but John Mitchell, okay. Uh, so he's gonna sing, sharing how data and evidence underpins the UK leading role in offshore wind to enable net zero energy security and nature recovery. I had to read the sentence a couple of times. <laughs> next time you have to make a shorter title, make a shorter title next one, because this one is different to catch on. But, uh, but we'll listen, of course. Amazing. Um, hi everyone, my name is, is actually Johnny Mitchell, that's what everyone calls me, so Johnny, Johnny, close enough. Um, I'm here in place of Chelsea Bradbury, she made up the title, not me, I'm getting in, that, that in there now as well. Um, and I'm a marine data manager at the Crown Estate, and I'm here to talk about how marine data can enable net zero and nature recovery in the UK. So I'm very aware this is the last slot of the day, you're all out of caffeine and sugar, you're probably not going to be very awake. This isn't going to be that technical. I'm going to spin a bit of yarn and hopefully it will be interesting for you. So I'm going to start by talking or sort of setting the scene, uh, introduce the Crown Estate um, and our strategy and our role in the UK and England, Wales and Northern Ireland. I'll then introduce the Marine Data Exchange and go on about how we've uh, got industry data being utilized and used um, in projects that are impacting um, sort of net zero and that sort of thing. And then briefly point towards the future. So. What is the current situation on the seabed in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland? So the map on screen shows the sort of assets that the Crown Estate leases for. So this is offshore wind, cables, carbon storage, aggregates, and pipelines. This looks pretty busy, right, already? Uh, well, if you overlay stuff like marine protected areas, shipping, shipping channels, defense zones, visual impact assessment areas, you end up with a map that really, really highlights just how busy and constrained the UK seabed already is. And this doesn't even have priority fishing areas on it either. So there's a lot going on out there, as I know you're all aware. However, we're in a world that, while it is already incredibly busy, we're going to need to utilize even more of it if we're going to get to net zero. So net zero targets are driving the push for energy infrastructure offshore. Achieving net zero implies something like 75 to 115 gigawatts of offshore wind in the UK alone. For context, we're only at 15 gigawatts at the moment. Uh, and we're going to need trans transmission cables, interconnectors, CCUS and tidal energy. And this all means that seabed demand is probably going to increase something like t uh, by 10 times out to 2050. We're also, again, as you're all aware, we're in a marine biodiversity crisis as well. And we really need to act fast to protect and restore biodiversity. So habitat protection is key to the UK government's 25-year uh, environment plan. That's 30 by 30 to everyone. Um, but as the seabed gets more crowded, and leasing and licensing and development choices are going to have more and more impact. Um, however, there are definitely major opportunities to enhance nature as well, co-location, direct investment into nature, that sort of thing. And lastly, one of the things that is preventing some of the work to prevent or uh, get to net zero and nature recovery is uh, we need more visibility and coordinated actions to gain funding that is required to reach net zero and nature recovery. So we, we've got constraints around offshore energy grids and supply chains. We don't have a direct mechanism for investment into nature as well. So all the problems that here, all of this is the responsibility of a wide range of government bodies, agencies, and seabed user groups in the UK. And there isn't really convening power. Uh, power to bring in, bring everyone together. And this is where the, the Crown Estate sort of comes in. We are a slightly odd business. We're an independent commercial business established by an act of parliament in 1961. And we manage the seabed around England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, not Scotland. That's very important to get in there. Um, we return all of our net revenue profit to the UK Treasury. But importantly, we have a purpose that allows us to think in the long term. We, our purpose is to create lasting and shared prosperity for the nation, and we view this through the prism of environmental, social, and financial value. So as the custodian of the marine environment in the UK, as the people who are leasing the seabed, uh, we lead on sustainable development, balancing protecting the seabed with the creation of lasting value. We have some core capabilities. We look across all sectors. Uh, we can bring people together. We have a strong convening power, and as I've said, we can look in the long term. And our strategic priorities are as follows. We want a thriving marine environment, an optimized and pro productive seabed, and a UK that is catalyzed towards a net zero future. These are not short-term goals, and they cannot be achieved in isolation. And 
to really achieve these, we need high quality data and the insights that we can draw from it. And this is why I'm here today, because we do play a role in marine data and evidence in uh, the UK. We work alongside our customers and stakeholders. We lead and fund programs that not only identify and address evidence gaps, but also challenge the status quo and drive positive change. Currently, we're driving forward the Marine Data Exchange, which is very much why I'm here at IMDIS, um, our survey data platform. Uh, the, we also have the Offshore Wind Evidence and Change Program, which is a Crown Estate funded, evident, uh, Crown Estate funded program of work that will create a new shared data and evidence base that can be used to shape the future of offshore wind and the marine environment. We also have a hold of seabed program. This is pioneering work to digitally map the seabed space needed to meet for future, future demand for a wide range of industries, infrastructure, and habitats out to 2050. So outputs from these programs can provide an evidence base to better understand engineering, consenting, and environmental challenges, while fostering collaborations between academia, government, industry, and environmental groups, trying to come up with positive solutions together. So I briefly mentioned the Marine Data Exchange just now. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that now. So this is our offshore industry survey data platform. And it was set up in 2013. And data is acquired through uh, what we describe as the data clause, which is a contractual obligation within all of the Crown Estate's project leases. The survey database holds over 285, terabyte, 280 terabytes of multidisciplinary survey data. And this amounts to something like 3,000 surveys, research outputs, and studies. 60% of this data is publicly available. And excitingly, it, this uh, MDE also now covers the whole of the UK again because uh, Scotland have come back on board as of this May, which is quite exciting for us. We're also affiliated with Medin. Medin. We're a, a sponsor of Medin, and we utilize all of their MES data standards and data guidelines as part of our QA processes. So an industry data portal with publicly available data is, is not the most common thing. So I thought I'd share a little bit about how, how we've made this work. So firstly, we've re worked really closely with industry, aiming to improve their experience, reduce effort, and speed up delivery and response times for getting data uploaded to our portal. Um, we've also picked something of a middle ground on standardization. Uh, I'm going to go into the positives and negatives of that in a sec. But we ask for survey data to be compliant with the relevant MEDIN data guidelines, but don't ask for specific formats or file types. This is positives and negatives. It reduces to, uh, barriers in terms of time and cost of delivery of data that has led to a data holding that's not fully standardized and thus is harder to draw insights from. However, it has meant we've received buy-in from industry. They're happy to provide the data to us. Um, we also, uh, as I mentioned, 60% of our uh, database is publicly available. We have a confidentiality process to ensure that we get the data in so it doesn't get lost. So um, our confidentiality process is based on dialogue. The data clause is quite broad and allows us to adapt and evolve our approach as sectors develop and we can address any concerns where they arise. Where concerns are raised and adaption occurs, these can then be applied across all projects. Lastly, is something I want to focus on here is that in the first year, eight years of the MDE, we've really focused on the acquisition of, of data, simply getting it in through the door. A lot of our data comes from, UK, from, from offshore wind in the UK, and this actually started 10 years prior to the Marine Data Exchange coming into existence. So we've been playing catch up for a lot of the last 10 years. But we're really trying to refocus on FAIR now, FAIR data, as everyone's been saying at this conference. Um, as a result, over the last two years, we've really focused on improving our user experience, as well as improving the findability and reusability of our data. So we've been able to develop this industry data platform. How is some of this data being used? I've split this into some of the key areas against the Crown State's priorities. So um, firstly, some of the wind and geotechnical data that we hold on the MDE is being used to uh, uh, lower the cost of offshore wind. This is better informing developers around the levelized cost of energy, which reduces risks and costs on projects. We're also seeing a lot of the environmental data being used to understand and reduce the impact of offshore wind in other sectors, such as within uh, the Poseidon program, which aims to produce a nationwide marine environmental baseline in the UK. This is through a synthesis of uh, newly collected and reused data. Um, a lot of the environmental data from the MD is also being used in a number of eco-wind projects, which uh, explore the ecological consequences of offshore wind, and of course, multiple PhDs as well. We've also been able to feed into work uh, helping to speed up the deployment of offshore renewables too, reducing project development timelines through feeding data into platforms like OneBenthic, which is uh, run by CFAS in the UK, and also IC's uh, Joint Station Data Program uh, as well. 
We're also handing it oh, one minute. Better hurry up. Um, then into we're also feeding into projects such as Nature Inclusive Cable Enhancement Program, and we're also seeing mo multiple developers use the data to speed up the deployment of offshore wind. I will skip through this bit because I'm very aware that I'm about to run out of time, but this is sort of our ideal cycle. I'm sure this will be very familiar to many of you and you can probably replace the marine data exchange with any number of data repositories here. But we really want to see data feeding into, um, into well, net zero and nature restoration projects directly, but also furthering research and evidence. This can allow us to uh, develop our evidence base for the whole of CBID program, allow, uh, allowing us to enable that route map out to 2050, um, which allows us to predict where some of the stuff is going on the seabed, while also identifying gaps that can be resolved via more data collection. Um, where next for the uh, marine data exchange? Um, well, we think there's a number of bits that we can do to uh, help enable these efforts. Um, firstly, there's a number of areas, but PDF data extraction will be really key. We receive a lot of industry data reports, and we want to crack these and allow us to enrich, enrich our metadata quickly and easily using machine learning. Along with this, we want to use some of this information to uh, inform an internal large language model chat to aid some of the accessibility and understanding. Um, we're also doing a bit of work in a APIs. I know this isn't groundbreaking, but we really want to make our mess data at very least available via, via API and then make more, some of our more structured data types like AGS geotechnical data available. Um, we're also looking to try and reduce some of the cost and carbon of storing our data via some of Microsoft Azure's storage options. So, in summary, TC, custodian, custodian of the marine environment in, the U, in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. We play a role in the UK marine data space, and we like to think that the MDE demonstrates how industry data can be collected and utilized to enable the transition to net zero and nature recovery. Uh, we really want to ensure this continues and this data can benefit all and continues to be reused. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Any questions from anybody? <laughs> Very interesting talk. I really enjoy it. I want one question. When you, the, the, the information you get from the companies, you're using all of it or you're just taking part of it? I mean, it's how you're dealing with, uh, uh, I mean, you work with companies. I, I guess there's some private thing and some public yes. thing. So how are you dealing with that? Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, so we bring in sort of only the primary survey data from, um, from, from the companies, so the, that initial, say, you're doing a geophysical survey for an offshore wind farm, we'll only ask for that initial survey report. We're not going to get into engineering design or anything like that, technical elements related to turbine design or anything like that. We sort of do a hard line there to ensure that they're happy to provide the data to us. Thank you, really nice to put together. Um, how do you balance the fundamentally different data cultures between the different research communities? So I'm thinking of the biological community who lean towards closed data because there's never enough data and the, the, the results they get, there's, there's less certainty versus the physics community which tend to be more open by default. And there's a really a challenging clash between those cultures sometimes. So do you have to balance that and how to do that? That's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure I have a definitive answer for you, but it is, it is it's definitely a challenge. I mean, we're quite lucky in that the data that we bring in, we have a contractual obligation behind it. They have to provide it to us. Um, but the timelines about some, some of the confidentiality of releasing that data shifts with, with sort of project stages. So that's one, one way we handle it. For a lot of industry, um, they're more concerned about the site characteristics, the geotechnical, the geophysical side of things, rather than the, um, the more environmental data that's usually mandated by government to collect that. Um, and strangely enough, they're normally more happy to release it. I think in, on the academic side, we don't hold a great deal of academic data, but um, there's definitely more concern there. And we try and take a bit of a flexible approach. The main thing is preserving this data and making it available when we can. More? People like a question or not? No? John, then, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>